May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. My dear friends in Christ, we read in Acts chapter 27, When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called a northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. If this story had happened a week ago, I would never have believed it. I would never believe it because it wouldn't have happened this way. That the sailors would have seen this store coming a long time before they set sail. That the captain would have pulled out his smartphone, loaded up his weather app, he would have seen the radar, he would have seen the line of storms coming toward him, and he would have said, guys, we've got to hold off for a couple of days, and then we can set sail. That's how much things have changed in 2,000 years. And of course, it's the same way for us, right? We can see the weather coming four states away so that we can make our plans with better knowledge. How many of us don't check the weather before we head out on a, a long journey so that we know in case we run into some kind of weather if we can be prepared for it? It gives us a, a sense of security, a sense that we're in control of at least a little part of our lives. Until, of course, until, of course, we're not. Some disaster strikes and our lives start to fall apart. That, that vision of our future that we had so vividly and assuredly in our mind is utterly ruined. Some tragic phone call, some diabolical email, some post on Facebook, some comment at work, some memo from your boss, some unexpected event, and that gentle southerly breeze that we were riding on all of a sudden is turned into a hurricane of grief and sadness and anger or frustration. If only we had some kind of life event radar some, some kind of app that we could call up on our smartphone that would warn us of impending disaster. As we sip our morning coffee, catching up with the news, we could load up the app and we could tech, look at our wife and say, oh, we better be careful today. It looks like there's a 20% chance of betrayal today. Wouldn't that be great? Actually, no, it probably wouldn't because God knows that that would rob us of something very important. God knows that that would rob you and me of the opportunity to learn how to sail through disaster. In a ironic and divine twist, though, St. Paul was given just that kind of radar. Some months before the events in our text today, St. Paul was talking to the leaders in the church in Ephesus. Here's what he had to say to them. I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Paul knew that things weren't going to go well for him when he got to Jerusalem. Yet he went anyway. He was determined to fulfill his calling. And he used that warning to help him prepare for what was to come. And what happened to him in Jerusalem was nothing short of, of one disaster after another, of, of disasters that, that started in days and stretched to weeks and months and lasted even years. He got to Jerusalem, he was arrested, he was thrown into prison a couple of years, and then finally he was shipped off to Rome where he would stand trial before none other than Emperor Nero himself. And that trip to Rome was, was a disaster in itself because they were sailing in the off-season. The Romans considered sailing after September in the Mediterranean to be very risky and to sail after November to be suicidal. Well, Paul's journey happened in September or October and probably lasted into November. And of course, we know that the weather didn't cooperate with them. The journey from Crete started off okay, that gentle southerly wind, but all of a sudden it almost immediately turned into this 
hurricane wind that they called the Northeaster. The sailors did the best they could. They, they pulled in the, the small boat that they were towing behind them. They wrapped some ropes around the ship to hold it together. They tried to slow the ship down. They, they even threw the cargo and the block and tackle overboard to lighten the ship, but it was all pointless. The storm raged on. And note the text. Finally, we gave up all hope of being saved. Things were out of control. Things were out of their control. They were panicking. They were motivated by fear. They had done everything in their power to try to control the situation, and it was failing them. And they just finally resigned themselves to their fate and watched their lives end in a disastrous way. It's kind of hard to imagine the scene. You've got this ship in the middle of the storm, 200 people or so. Later on, we're told there are about 200 people on the boat. 200, about 200 people huddled together, nervous, desperate, panicking even. And in the middle of that raging storm, a man stands up to talk to them. It's Paul. And Paul has this incredible message for them. He says, you know, human efforts are, are failing you guys. It's not working. But don't worry. God sent an angel to me last night, and he told me that none of us are going to die. We're not told in the text, though, if anybody even listened to what Paul said. We're not told if anybody even took courage from his words. It's easy to see why. When your life is falling apart all around you, when you've been thrown off the cliff and you're falling and there's nothing that will stop you, what good are the words of some Jewish prisoner going to do? A Jewish prisoner is probably hallucinating. Just shut up, Paul, and let me die. Words seem of so little value to us when our world is falling apart. Even the words of God. And there's a very important reason for that. It's not good, though. For some of you, life is going fairly well right now. You have no major disasters weighing down on your hearts. You're not in crisis mode. Life is sort of plugging along. Oh, sure, there's, there's hiccups here and there, just like in any life. But no, nothing major. For you, it's easy to say, God is taking care of me. No disaster it will befall me. No harm is coming near my tent. For others of you, life is not going so well right now. It's crisis mode for you. You are weighed down by some disaster. In fact, it's a wonder you even made it to church here today with all that's going on in your life. For you, it seems ridiculous to say, God is taking care of me. Disaster is befalling me. Harm is right inside of my tent. But whether your life is going great or your life isn't going so great, we treat God's word as if it depended on us. I'm in control, and so I will claim the blessings of God by the choices that I make in my life. And how, how frustrated, how angry, how depressed, how sad we get when no matter how hard we try, when no matter even making all of the right decisions, we've trimmed the sails, we've pulled in the lifeboat, we've slowed the ship down, we've even thrown the cargo overboard, and still, and still, the disasters come. And we quietly curse God under our breath because secretly we never really wanted God to be in control anyway. It was fine for us to claim God as my God when he was in the passenger seat giving assent to even, even blessing my plans. But when God took over the wheel and drove me into a dangerous and disastrous places, then I wasn't so willing because I wasn't in control. It's so easy for us to look to God and say, you can be my God when life is going well but take it to the extreme. And finally, we throw our hands up in the air and say, finally, we gave up all hope of being saved. Oh, you of little faith. 
Remember Jesus' words to the disciples as they're bailing the water out of the boats on the Sea of Galilee in our gospel today? I mean, the, the cognitive dissonance in this text, the gospel today, is so deafening. Here we have the creator of the, of the entire universe sleeping in, in the bow of this boat, the stern of this boat, who doesn't even realize that not only is his pillow soaking wet, but the boat he's in is sinking. How can it be right that he would wake up and scold the disciples for being afraid when the one who seemingly is supposed to be in control is asleep at the wheel? And yet, there it is. You have little faith. You see, it's not so much that, that faith is extinguished in these moments. It is that it is stretched so thin. The way out, the way out is in something that is totally beyond our control. The way out is in the promises that God has made to you and me. Your God has put his reputation as your savior on the line when he put Jesus on the cross and raised him from the dead. The promise is this. You are my dear child and nothing, nothing is going to separate you from me. God reminded Paul of that promise through that angelic messenger who told him that he must stand trial before Caesar. The gospel purposes must be fulfilled in Paul's life. Paul had to proclaim the gospel to other people. It had to happen. It was God's will. I wonder what musts there are when you and I suffer. Must you suffer so that God is glorified in your life? Must you suffer so that God can strip away all the idols that we prop up in our lives so easily? Must you suffer so that when everything is gone, when there is nowhere else to go, all that remains is God and his promises? It must happen that way. It is God's will. It is God's will that you and I suffer because suffering brings spiritual clarity. When all else has been removed, when all of my human efforts, when, when all of our plans that so easily focus on me, me, me evaporate, all that's left is your heavenly Father standing there with his hand outstretched in love to you, saying, I have you, my child. I love you. Stop trusting in all that other stuff and rest secure in me. It must happen that way. God must save you because Jesus already has. Don't you see? The disciples couldn't drown in the Sea of Galilee because then the Savior of the world would have drowned. Paul wasn't going to die on that ship and, and God wasn't purposefully driving the wheel and, and, and taking those, those other people into their very death to punish them. Rather the opposite. Paul had to survive so that he could preach the gospel to Caesar. And you and I will sail through disaster because God will accomplish his purposes in your life. And even if that disaster is your end, your end is, is really the beginning, the beginning of something new and wonderful and perfect. It is the, the end of your time here on earth, which is the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of God's purposes in this world for you, to spend eternity with him. God has made you some incredible promises. And you know the other thing that's really neat about these promises is these promises inspire this, this tremendous insurmountable faith in our hearts. It is that same faith that, that St. Paul had, that, that faith that conquers mountains, that faith that Jesus talked about. Speak to that mountain and it will uproot itself and plant itself somewhere else. When you realize that no matter what happens to you in this world, that you are successful, you are unstoppable. 
That's the, that faith then that can, that can erupt into our hearts and, and, and show up in incredible ways in our lives. Look at what Paul said here. He said, I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. And I doubt that Paul just said that. He probably had to scream that because the wind was howling all around him. Again, from the outside, it doesn't make any sense at all. But from the clarity, the spiritual clarity that suffering brings, Paul could say with absolute confidence that God would keep his promise, that it would happen just like God said, because that's all that was left. And God has given you and me that same faith. God has put that, that same tremendous confidence into our hearts too. Take courage from what Paul says here. Take those disasters of life and exercise faith. Read your Bible and, and see how God's people sail from one disaster to the next and in faith conquer kingdoms, administer justice, shut the mouths of lions, quench the fury of the flames, receive what was promised, become powerful and, and rout foreign armies, receive back their dead. That's the same kind of faith God has given you. Be courageous. Be courageous because God has given you his word through his son. Be courageous and weigh your anchor. Point your ship into the dark clouds of this life. Hold your course steady and sail through disaster. Amen. Please stand. Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. Amen.